We're waiting for Dr. Weston. <laughs> Welcome to the March edition of the Low Carb Support Group meeting. I'm Amber Keithley. I'm the Heal Care Program Advisor, along with Dr. Eric Weston. We all know Dr. Weston. Uh, we have a special guest tonight. We're very excited about. And Amy Berger is the author of Alzheimer's Antidote. She has a master's in human nutrition. She is a certified nutrition specialist. She's a U.S. Air Force vet. And a wonderful we're looking forward to hearing from her this evening. Um, but to get us started, I just want to um, have Dr. Westman kind of talk a little bit about, we have um, the last of the OPO. The OPO is going to be ending March 23rd, I believe. 20 days. Yeah, yeah. So not very long. So um, I'll let Dr. Westman talk about that a little bit. Thanks, Amber. And uh, has anyone um, become an investor in the Gila Clinic? Just raise your hand. Thank you so much. Look around. These are these are people who want to shape the future. They bring keto into the mainstream. Has anyone heard of keto? <laughs> uh, there's only one company in the keto space that you can actually invest in, and that's the Heal Clinics, at least to my knowledge. And uh, I think that's true. And what we're doing is a uh, fundraise over the last couple months. We have 20 more days, and it's not a Kickstarter or, or you're giving away money and you never see it, or, or you're supporting your radio station. This is a, actually you're buying stock in the company, and so as the company grows, the stock grows, and all of that information is at the Heal Care, uh, um, or HealClinics.com <coughs> website. And I can't go beyond what the information is on the website for, for the Security Exchange Commission um, rules and regulations. But if you go to healclinics.com slash offering, and um, I think we have, uh, so healclinics.com slash offering, this is the screen that will come up. And it's been amazing to see since we started in the fall at zero, <laughs> it was here's 37, and now we're at about $680,000 raised so far. Thank you. Um, we're going for a million dollars to keep the clinics uh, open and marketing them and all. We have three clinics currently, two in North Carolina, one in Virginia, and we also have a non-medical program where you don't have to see someone in the clinic if you're not being treated for a medical problem. In fact, I think uh, a field care client uh, here tonight who's in the non-medical side of the program. So while we talk about field clinics and the clinic, there is also a non-clinical side to the program where you can be taught and followed <coughs> at a distance uh, through the field care system. And um, uh, does anyone have any questions about the the offering itself, so it, for as little as $480, you can actually buy stock. And this is something new just in the last couple of years. It used to be you'd have to uh, uh, put in something like $10,000 or $50,000 in order to invest in something. You know, so it, it was out of my range to invest in, in things like that. Uh, you may have heard the term accredited investor, where you had to be sure that you weren't just taking money from the little old man who was losing his mind and you know, didn't have any money left. So what's happened is this online offering has erased the requirement because the amount is so low to prove that you are an accredited investor. And that's it. So the old system has been upgraded and, and with the idea that the grassroots change is where the change is going to happen in this world. You know, how many of you have waited a while for the government guidelines to change? <laughs> All of us. Uh, how many of you waited for your doctor to start talking about this and, and you were waiting for a long time? But we can't wait. So it's a perfect uh, uh, coming together of a grassroots change that needs to happen from
from a lot of people putting in a little amount of money, and, and the online offering allows that to happen. So most people, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if we have the updated one, no we don't today, but most people put in between $500 or $480 and $1,000. So there have been 650 people who put in uh, or uh, purchased stock in the company. So uh, anyway, this is my, uh, I, mean, I guess we'd say it's my swan song or, or my culmination of, of 20 years of clinical trial research. And um, I thought that was enough to change things. I, I thought that academic medicine, that doing research and publishing papers would be enough to make change. And it's not. And so we're facing a system that has all sorts of reasons for not wanting to change. The main one being follow the money. You know, uh, so I really encourage you to consider this carefully. Uh, we're good stewards of any investment that comes to us, and I hope with your help, we'll actually meet the million dollar, dollar goal in the next 20 days. So, thank you for your consideration for the Heal Care and Heal Clinics. It's my pleasure to introduce Amy Berger, who um, we met a while back, and I've known about Amy, and I saw her at a conference, and, and um, the Alzheimer's antidote is the major, I, I think, uh, claim to fame that you have in the, the keto world. She actually is, is a writer of other things as well, perhaps novels, and you have to just <laughs> ask her about all those things offline. But um, I think uh, Tuit Nutrition, T-U-I-T, Nutrition is known, uh, that's uh, Amy's website, for uh, giving a kind of no-nonsense <coughs> Call out the BS. Look at keto and nutrition in general. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Amy to talk about a different topic tonight, and maybe you can just go ahead and introduce it yourself. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming out and sharing your Tuesday night with us. I will try to make it worth your while. I don't have to like juggle all this stuff. Um, oh, so. <laughs> this is only the second time I've ever given this talk, so instead of being offended that it might not be perfect for you, you should feel flattered, because I trust you enough to go easy on me if I screw it up. <laughs> so bear with me, this is like only a practice round. Um, we're going to talk about something that I don't think gets talked about enough in the keto world, and that's mental health. And when I say mental health, I mean mental health and emotional health, so not just you know, what do I mean? Actual diagnosable conditions like a bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, anxiety disorder, you know, clinical depression, but also when we experience these things but we actually haven't been diagnosed with a formal illness. You can have emotional instability or feel anxious or feel blue, feel depressed, but not have an actual diagnosis. So I, when I say mental health or emotional health, I mean all of that together. All right. We know, we know, or we should know, or most of us know, that keto is good for all of this stuff, right? Type 1 and type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, epilepsy, migraine, acne, GERD, PCOS, hypertension. And this is just the short list, right? This is the short list. This is like the list only of stuff that there's actual published medical literature on. Dr. Westman's a real stickler for that. Every one of these conditions has at least some scientific literature published on it, and he's the author of only like 90% of it. <laughs> the author or co-author. We have Dr. Yancey, we have Dr. Finney, we have all these other people, but. Um, so, keto works wonders for the body, right? Keto is dynamite for the physical body. If it's so good for the physical body, what do we think it might do for the mind? And before I forget, because keto is good for the mind, and I don't want to forget, I want to say hello. Hopefully there's a lot of people watching on Facebook right now, or I advertise this on my blog, I advertise it on Twitter, on Facebook. If you're watching, hello out there in internet land, thank you for tuning in. Um, okay, moving on. I didn't want to forget all the fans online. So, 
What, what might it do for the mind? So let's, let's go back. Um, when somebody has a physical issue, when you are in a wheelchair or you're on crutches or you have obesity, other people can see that you might need some extra help, right? You might need some extra loving, you might need a special accommodation. They can look at somebody like that and say, you know, that person might need a larger chair, she might need help getting up the stairs, you know, we need to help this person out. Unfortunately, when you have a mental or emotional situation, it's not visible, right? Nobody can look at you from the outside and say, wow, that guy could really use a friend today. Or, man, I, I hope she gets help, she looks like she needs some help. Because we can't see it. But just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's any less severe, it doesn't mean it's any less um, difficult to deal with, doesn't mean it's any less dangerous to have it in your life. So, um, it's, it's sort of easy to dismiss the mental and emotional issues, and, and it's even easier for anyone who's never experienced something like that to look at someone and say, why can't you just? Why don't you just? Why can't you just cheer up? Just look on the bright side. Why can't you just get up and get your stuff done? What's wrong with you? Why can't you just? Please never, ever, ever tell someone with clinical depression to just cheer up or just look on the bright side. That's a whole separate topic. That is the dumbest thing you can say to somebody with depression. Don't ever say to somebody with anxiety, why don't you just calm down? Why don't you just, why don't you just stop eating carbs? Because it's not easy, right? It's not that easy. Why don't you just, why don't you just stop eating all the sugar and all the bread? Because it's not that easy for some of us, you know? Come on, give us a break. So there's the brain, there's the body, and the BBB is short for the blood-brain barrier. If you're not aware of what the blood-brain, can you all hear me? Every time I breathe it. I don't know where to hold this so you hear me, but you don't hear all that breathing. <laughs> I'm just out of breath. I'm nervous. I don't know. Okay. So, the blood brain barrier is a very, very thin layer of cells that separates your body from the brain. But it's not an impenetrable force field. It's, it's more like a, a sieve or a strainer that lets certain things through and keeps other things from getting through. So it's not, it's, you know, things, things that it lets through are things we want to get into the brain, things like fuel, things like vitamins and minerals and cholesterol and fats and all the good things our brain needs and the stuff that has to pass out to get sent out, toxins, normal metabolic waste products that have to be gotten rid of. So the blood-brain barrier does separate the brain from what goes on in the rest of the body, but it doesn't, it's not a brick wall. Things are supposed to get in and out. And if you've ever heard the term leaky gut, have you ever heard leaky gut? Yeah. So most of you, it just as a quick 20 second thing, if you've never heard of it, leaky gut is where your small intestine is not quite as, it doesn't have the integrity it's supposed to have. It's a little, it's got some holes in it so that stuff, halfway digested food particles that aren't normally supposed to be able to enter the bloodstream, <coughs> end up entering the bloodstream. And they're actually starting to look at something called leaky brain now, or leaky blood-brain barrier, where things that are not supposed to get into the brain are getting into the brain. I don't know if they've proven for sure that this is a thing, that this really exists, but they're looking at it, and it's interesting. And if, if any of you are dealing with anything like anxiety, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, what have you, I would lay down money that it's not all in your mind. And I don't mean that as the insulting part of like, oh, it's all in your head, you're making this up, you're just, you have bad thoughts. I mean that if you have something like that, where we typically think it's a psychological thing, it's a thought thing, it's a brain thing, I would lay down money that there's something going on in your physical body that you just haven't connected yet to the brain thing. And it's not so much that one is causing the other. It could be that, but it could also be that there's a third factor causing everything, right? So like the short list of, of physical symptoms that I know of that correlate to or are associated with or tend to go hand in hand with things like depression or anxiety and things like that, it could be almost anything. It could be, um, I don't know where that's coming from. Oh well, we love you anyway, whoever you are. 
as long as it's not my phone, that would be really embarrassing. <laughs> um, it could be anything. Things like, like so many people with, with some of these issues that we consider to be all in the mind have a lot of skin issues. It could be acne, it could be rosacea, eczema, psoriasis, it could be gut, it could be constipation, it could be diarrhea, it could go either way. It could be joint pain, it could be headaches, it could be all kinds of stuff that you don't realize it's actually all coming from the same underlying source. So nothing ever only happens in the mind or only ever happens in the body, right? If, if you were a kid or let's say you're a nutritionist who has to give a talk in front of a lot of people. Or, you know, when you were a kid, if you played in the band and you had a recital or you had a big, you were like a football jock and you had a big game, you get really nervous before you perform. Oh my God, what if I screw up? Oh my God, I hope I don't look stupid. Where does that manifest? All those nerves are in your head, right? I hope this goes well, I hope it don't mess up, oh my god, oh my god. That's where it manifests, right? Yeah. You get nauseous. Sometimes you might have to run to the bathroom. So we have that phrase, butterflies in my stomach, or I, I have a nervous stomach. If, if all of this was solely in the mind, why would you feel nauseated? Why would you get diarrhea? Because it's all connected. None of this ever just happens in the body or just happens in the brain. So with that in mind, if we're gonna talk about body and brain and we're talking about keto, let's talk about food. Foods have psychoactive properties. If you don't think foods have psychoactive properties, you've probably never given a six-year-old a candy bar. <laughs> we all know we're all laughing. I see some grandparents in the audience. You spoil them rotten, we know. Mom and dad give them good food at home and they go to grandma's for the weekend and like all of you know what breaks loose. <laughs> anyway, so we know, we know foods have psychoactive properties. Chocolate, cocoa has something called PEA in it, phenylethylamine. They call it a love chemical. There's a reason we all love chocolate so much. Women more so than men, I don't know why, but there's, that's why we love chocolate. If you still don't believe me that foods have psychoactive properties, you are not, like me, one of these people that is not human until you've had your coffee. <laughs> God help the person that tries to speak to you before you've had the coffee, yeah. right? Amen, I mean, for me, it only takes like two sips. I don't even have to finish the cup. Two sips, and I'm a different person. Now you can approach me. Now I'm calm, now I'm rational, but that's what the coffee does, right? Um, something else that has psychoactive properties. There is a reason everybody loves pizza. Yeah. There's a reason everybody loves macaroni and cheese. <laughs> wheat and cheese are probably the two, or wheat and dairy, are two of the most highly addictive food substances. There's a reason it's so hard to give them up. Thank God on keto you don't have to. Well, the wheat is, you know, there's some high, high bran, high fiber cracker type items out there, low carb wraps and, and the dairy. You know, if you tolerate dairy, you can have plenty of cheese, thank goodness. But the proteins in wheat and in dairy get broken down, they get cleaved into these little peptides, which are just little strings of amino acids, that some of these enter the gut, whether we have leaky gut or not, I think sometimes they get into the bloodstream when they're not supposed to. And the, you've probably heard of the protein, the protein gluten, in wheat. Mm -hmm. So there's these little peptides, these little sections of amino acids that get chopped up during digestion, and it's called gluteomorphine. And you've probably heard of the casein protein in dairy, right? From casein. Yeah. There's something called casomorphine. If you think gluteomorphine and casomorphine remind you of just regular morphine, you're right. <laughs> there's a reason this stuff is so addictive. It literally has psychoactive properties. There's a reason we all feel so much better when we eat this stuff. Now, only temporarily, right? An hour later, a day later, you might feel like garbage, but in the moment, <laughs> your brain's very happy. So, talking about food, talking about the brain, talking about mood, talking about keto. There's at least five ways, five reasons why keto should, at least in theory, be really good for mental health. There's probably a lot more than five. These are the five I know of and that I'm comfortable talking about. Number one, we're gonna start with the most obvious, blood sugar regulation. Am I, can everyone see the slides? Am I in the way for anybody? You guys are good? Okay. 
Um, good thing I'm so short. <laughs> I personally think, and maybe Dr. Westman can corroborate, I don't know, I personally think that so much of what we consider to be anxiety attacks or panic attacks or road rage or mood swings or just, I don't know what else, is, is really solely the result of wild swings in blood sugar, the wild ups and downs, right? So let's, let's look at a typical high carb diet. Let's, here's your blood sugar on the, on the y-axis and then, or is that the y? I haven't been to math class in so long. <laughs> that is the y-axis, right, the vertical one? All right. Um, I'm a writer, not a, not a math person. Let's say between the two green lines is a normal blood sugar. You're on a high carb diet. Let's say you're insulin resistant, or let's say you're just carb intolerant. Your blood sugar is doing this all day. You're high, you're low, you're high, you're low all day long. And so this, these low points here, this is hypoglycemia, right? Yeah, right. Below. And hypoglycemia, I actually have a video coming out next week on my YouTube channel on hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is not necessarily being down here with blood sugar like in the 60s or 50s. Hypoglycemia might also, in some people, be triggered by the, the speed of the drop. So let's say your blood sugar is 85, totally normal blood sugar, but let's say it was 130, 30 minutes before that. That quick plummet could also trigger what we call hypoglycemia. It's not hypoglycemia because your blood sugar is normal, but you have those feelings as if it's low. So what are, the, what are some of the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia? Irritability, feeling angry, feeling shaky, feeling ravenously hungry, um, feeling nauseated, um, sweaty. sweaty. Yeah. What, what does that sound like? Sounds like an anxiety attack, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound like a panic attack? There's a lot of overlap between those feelings, and it may be, and I'm speculating, but it may be that at least in some people, those things are triggered by unrecognized hypoglycemia. So let's look at what happens when we eat a low carb or ketogenic type diet. What's my blood sugar doing now? Practically nothing. My blood sugar, instead of doing this, it's doing this. So much more gentle, these little rolling hills, staying totally normal. My blood sugar is on an even keel. My brain is on an even keel. My mood is stable. My emotions are stable all as well, right? Some of you, you don't have to raise your hands, but some of you, some of me, might have experienced this in our own lives. I mean, honestly, I, I think probably 99% of road rage is hypoglycemia, right? Because the, it often happens. <laughs> evening commute, evening rush hour, People, maybe they had lunch at 11 or noon. They haven't eaten in five or six hours. Or maybe they did. Maybe they had a scone and a latte at three so that by five or six in the car, the blood sugar's tanking, right? Hello? So the second reason why keto might be good for anything mental and emotional is something called GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. So when we're thinking about that sort of hypoglycemic, shaky, hungry, angry, that feeling is your sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight. When your blood sugar gets really low, that sympathetic nervous system gets activated in order to bring it up. And what it does is it floods you with epinephrine, with adrenaline, it floods you with cortisol, which are designed to flood your body with fuel, mainly in the form of glucose. So um, what happens in that process is adrenaline, and there's some other hormones and neurotransmitters that we call excitatory, excitatory, <coughs> they make things fire, they make things happen. And it, we don't know, but some of these sort of emotional volatility type things that we have could be some of that reaction. And GABA does the opposite. So GABA is the body's most calming neurotransmitter. So instead of being excitatory and making things fire and go, GABA, calms things down, GABA helps you relax. So GABA's like the Japanese Zen garden in your mind. <laughs> this is GABA. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna come back to GABA in, a, in, a, in another slide, okay. If you don't know that ketones are good for the brain, 
I have a whole book on that very topic. I happen to have some copies here for sale, no pressure. <laughs> but um, we, I mean, this, this is a slam dunk. This is, a, I see, it's awesome. This is a slam friggin' dunk. <laughs> if you don't think that, why wouldn't you want ketones to feed your brain? So, I, in, in Alzheimer's specifically, Alzheimer's disease is a problem of glucose metabolism in the brain. The brain has become unable to properly metabolize glucose, so it basically starves for energy. It's a fuel crisis in the brain. Now that is in Alzheimer's disease, but who's to say that something similar, although much, much more mild, isn't going on when people have brain fog, right? If your brain is not being adequately fueled, maybe you have brain fog, maybe you've got cobwebs in your mind, maybe you have fatigue, maybe you have depression, maybe all of these sort of low energy brain states are coming for the same reason, although again, in a much, much more mild form. Um, so ketones are brain fuel, period. When you burn ketones, when you have ketones fueling your brain, molecule for molecule, you actually get more energy from ketones than you get from glucose. And ketones, without boring you with the biochem, think of them as a cleaner burning fuel. When you burn ketones as opposed to burning glucose, you get sort of less pollution, if you will, less damage to the mitochondria, less damage to your cells. So why wouldn't you want to run on ketones? And some of you, again, may have experienced this for yourself. You may have come from a history of brain fog or fatigue or something like that, and that's totally gone. Um, I know for me, I still, for various reasons, tend toward depression. I'm a very melancholy person, and I don't measure my ketones all the time, but I notice that when I am in a deeper state of ketosis, I feel better. I never have brain fog. I'm always sharp thinking, but my emotions are on a much, much higher plane when I have higher ketones. And that's just end of one anecdote, but I can't deny that. All right. <coughs> Don't be scared how crazy this slide looks. We're going to explain it all. Before we start, in order for this to make sense, did you all know that the ketogenic diet was not originally developed as a weight loss diet? It wasn't developed as a diabetes diet. It's not a PCOS diet. It's not a fatty liver diet. It was an epilepsy diet. This is an anti-seizure diet. This diet was developed in the 1920s in order to treat children with epilepsy whose epilepsy did not respond to the medications that were available. It was like, I think they call it refractory epilepsy or you know, medically resistant <coughs> epilepsy. And for whatever reason, kids on the ketogenic diet either stopped having seizures altogether or the seizures were reduced in frequency and severity. Um, they don't even know why. There's so, so, so many possible reasons why. And most likely, it's all of them. It's probably not one single thing that the ketogenic diet does that's stopping the seizures. It's probably a confluence of them. Or it could be different things in different people. You know, seizures are triggered by different things in different people. So they may be responding to something different about the ketogenic diet. Before we get to what's on this slide, two things about why keto could possibly or very likely reasons why it does help. The blood sugar regulation, remember that crazy slide with the blood sugar on the high carb diet? Here's the low carb keto diet with the blood sugar. In some people with epilepsy, kids and adults, their seizure control is not actually tied to their ketone level, meaning if they have higher ketones, it doesn't really control the epilepsy better than lower ketones. Some people's seizures are more controlled by keeping the blood sugar low regardless of where the ketones are. And in some people, it's not just keeping the blood sugar low, but keeping it stable. So instead of like, even if it's a little bit higher, as long as it was stable and consistent throughout the day, they don't seize instead of being up and down all the time. So correcting the blood sugar, volatility could be one reason why keto helps. The increased GABA could be another reason. GABA, again, is the calming inhibitory neurotransmitter. What is happening in epilepsy? Neurons are firing when they're not supposed to fire, right? Think, ah, oh, it's just going crazy. GABA in, it's inhibitory, it's sort of inhibits that from happening. Now the next piece of that puzzle for epilepsy and mental and emotional health in keto is stabilizing neuronal membranes. 
and we're going to break this down, no big deal. This, this is a pointer, Woo. this little centerpiece is just a cell membrane. There's a lot of stuff in it and around it, but that's just a cell membrane. And you see, um, you've, we all know how important electrolytes are on the ketogenic diet, right? So we see this Na, if you all remember back from like high school biology or high school chemistry class, the periodic table, that's sodium. The Cl is chloride. So NaCl from, from sodium chloride, salt, that's why we love salt on keto. Don't be afraid of salt unless, because Dr. Westman's here, I have to be serious about it. If you're on blood pressure medication, if you're on heart medication, maybe you need to watch the sodium. Most of us don't, but you know, to be medically responsible. Um, so, and then we also see K, K down here, K is for potassium. These things are called electrolytes, electrolytes. The brain is an electrical organ. It's like an electrochemical organ. Um, we see, it's, th think of your, your cell membrane, or especially your neuronal memory, it's almost like a battery. You've got 60 millivolts, it's like a charge. There's a charge gradient across your cell membrane. And one of the things that might trigger a seizure is when these electrolytes are out of balance. Um, so potassium is the most abundant electrolyte inside your cell, and right outside your cell and in the blood, sodium's the most abundant, and there's also a lot of chloride. And these electrolytes have to be in the proper balance in order for the membrane to work properly and in order for those neurons to fire when they're supposed to fire and not fire when they're not supposed to fire. So what seems to happen in epilepsy is they're firing when they're not supposed to fire. And it's possible, again, just speculating, it's possible that the same type of neuronal misfiring Maybe in some people, that triggers an anxiety attack or a panic attack or a migraine. I could do a whole separate talk on migraine someday. <laughs> um, so keto, for some reason, seems to normalize this. It normalizes the electrolyte balance, if you will, the ratios. And it's not necessarily because you're getting more of the electrolytes. It's not necessarily because you're eating more sodium chloride and salt and you're getting more potassium. Keto just seems to have a way of correcting things that are not the way they're supposed to be. And I, I wish I could tell you why, that's kind of the magic of it. We don't know why, we're still researching why, we just know that it works. Um, so when, how do I say this? It's kind of hard to explain. One of the things that keto does, by, partially by way of, of correcting where these electrolytes are and how they work, is something called hyperpolarization of the neuronal membrane. And, and all that means, so let, let's say like you have, if, if I just shout for one second, can you all hear me? Okay, because I think I need both hands. I, I said this on a YouTube video the other day, I'm not Italian, I'm Jewish, but I talk with my hands anyway. <laughs> Um, so if you have a neuronal membrane and it's firing when it's not supposed to fire, right, and that person is seizing or potentially maybe having a migraine or having an anxiety attack, what keto does, hyperpolarizing the membrane, hyper means high or big, right? So instead of your membranes being like this, let's say, and this, this is not a to scale demonstration, this is not a medical illustration, this is just like showing you sort of the idea here. Keto hyperpolarizes those neurons so that instead of whatever causes somebody to seize or triggers some sort of emotional situation, whatever that trigger is, it's going to take more of that for that person to have that problem. They're still susceptible to it, but instead of seizing at that trigger level, you the trigger has to be at this, it takes a lot more and a lot harder you become slightly more resistant to whatever the trigger is. And again, we don't know why. We don't know why that happens, but that is one of the things that happens on keto, and it's one of the reasons that's at least believed why it's so good for epilepsy and why I think it could potentially be good for all this other stuff. All right, my favorite thing to talk about is the nutrients. So a lot of things going on here. When I look at this, the first thing because I'm a foodie and I love to eat and I love to cook, what I see is really delicious, gorgeous, amazing food. That's the first thing I see. The second thing I see, because I'm a nutritionist, but, but because I'm a keto nutritionist, I don't see 
the saturated fat that's going to clog my artery from the cholesterol that's going to give me a heart attack and the pork that's just going to kill me tomorrow. Because I'm a keto nutritionist, let me tell you what I see when I look at this. I see DHA and other omega-3s in the salmon. I see vitamin K2 and calcium in the dairy. I see some iron and zinc and B12 and niacin in the red meat and the pork. I see choline in the egg yolks. I see vitamin C in the peppers. I see folate, magnesium, and potassium in the greens and the tomatoes. This is some dynamite nutrition right here. And so, so many reasons why just eating better food could help with mental and emotional issues. Um, healthy brain function, healthy emotional stability doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't happen by magic. It's not a coincidence. It's not a random thing. We need B12. I have a whole chapter on B12 in my book. A B12 deficiency alone, forget whatever else is going on in your life, a B12 deficiency alone could cause depression or anxiety. So we need B12, we need zinc, choline, iron, iodine. You name the nutrient, the brain doesn't work properly without it. And the thing is, it's, I think that we have a massive, massive nutritional insufficiency epidemic. And I said the word insufficiency, I didn't say deficiency. We don't see anymore, we don't see scurvy, right? Nobody's walking around with bleeding gums anymore like you read about in junior high health class. Nobody's got rickets anymore. Nobody's dying from pellagra. Have you all heard the three Ds of pellagra is a niacin deficiency, B3? The three Ds of pellagra, dermatitis, diarrhea, and dementia? Oh and if there's four, it's death? The four Ds of pellagra? Nobody has these classic deficiency diseases anymore. Um, but what we do have, in my opinion, is sort of like subclinical insufficiency. Subclinical meaning you're not sick enough to be diagnosed, but just because you don't have scurvy doesn't mean you're getting enough vitamin C. Just because you're not bow-legged from rickets doesn't mean you're getting enough vitamin D. Um, just because you're alive and functioning doesn't mean you're well, doesn't mean you're optimal. I have hypothyroidism, and before I got on the right medication for myself, I had severe, severe crippling depression. Now, thank God, it wasn't so severe that I wasn't able to just get up and get dressed and run my errands and get my work done. I hated doing it. I was miserable every second of it, but I did it. Just because I was alive didn't mean I was well. And I see that everywhere. You probably see it everywhere. You guys just haven't thought about it yet. All these people with this just weird malaise, just don't feel right, whether it's in the physical body or in the mind. How much of, we're just eating garbage. We're not eating enough of this gorgeous, beautiful, nutrient-dense food. I mean, there's a whole tangent I'm not gonna get into. I'll just say one sentence. <clears throat> please, please, do not fall for the false demonization of red meat or any other animal food product for that matter. It is one of the most nutrient-dense foods you could possibly put in your mouth. We have epidemics, especially among younger women who are the most susceptible to the anti-animal food message, anti-red meat message. They're anemic, they're B12 deficient, they're not menstruating, they feel like garbage, and the best thing they could possibly do is eat a steak. <laughs> and they're terrified to do it. Don't fall for it. If you don't eat red meat, that's fine, but don't eat it because maybe you just don't like the flavor or you're allergic to it or something. Don't avoid it because you think it's bad for you. And, and please don't let anyone else get away with saying that either. I digress. Um, so these are, yeah, these, these are loaded with nutrients. And here's the thing. It's not like you were getting no magnesium before. Like before you went keto, just eating regular American diet. It's not like you weren't getting any vitamin D or any zinc. Of course you were getting some, you know? But there's a couple of issues with that. The first is that when you were eating some of the other foods that you eliminate on a ketogenic diet, specifically grains or most grains and beans or most beans. I mean, we all know you can maybe eat very, very small amount of, of anything pretty much as long as your total carbs are under what? So, <laughs> I, got, I got a plug page for So, yeah, as, as long as you stay under whatever your personal carb threshold is, maybe it's 30, maybe it's 40. But as long as you stay under that, you could eat a tiny piece of bread if your total carbs were still low enough for you. The point is, 
some of those foods contain something called anti-nutrients. Has anyone ever heard that word? Okay, so some of you, it looks like it's new to most of you, which is good. Anti-nutrients are called anti-nutrients for a reason. They are compounds found in certain foods that actually impair or hinder the absorption of nutrients in those foods. And there's two big examples that we tend to hear about in the keto, low-carb, paleo even world. And the first one is something called phytic acid or phytate, P-H-Y-T-A-T-E. And it's a, it's a compound, it's in a lot of different foods, but it's predominant in grains and in beans, beans and legumes. And it binds to things like calcium, magnesium, zinc, and iron, making those harder to absorb from the foods that have those compounds in them. So when you get a bag of like black beans or kidney beans or something at the store, the dry beans, and you can look at the nutrition facts label, and it says, you know, half a cup serving provides X percent of the daily value of whatever nutrients. No, it doesn't. That's what's contained in the food. That doesn't mean that's what you're actually going to absorb and assimilate because some of it's bound up in the phytic acid. And cooking and, and certain preparation techniques reduce the amount of that stuff, but it's not 100%. And uh, the other one we hear about is oxalate or oxalic acid. If you've ever dealt with kidney stones or something, you've probably heard of oxalate. <laughs> oxalate is another compound that binds to and, and reduces the absorption of certain minerals. And the unfortunate thing is oxalates are in some very keto-friendly foods. Blueberries, Swiss chard, spinach, um, I think black tea. There's a whole bunch of oxalate-rich foods. The good news is, for the most part, cooking does reduce the oxalate content, especially if you boil and you don't drink the water. But anyway, the point is, the whole point of this, is that when you were eating more of the higher oxalate, higher phytate foods especially, you may have been getting a certain amount of minerals, but you were getting less than you're probably getting now, now that most of those foods are no longer part of your diet. So you're absorbing a lot more of these nutrients. And the even bigger kicker, for me anyway, is when you have chronic hyperglycemia or chronic hyperinsulinemia, meaning you have high blood sugar most of the time or high insulin most of the time, it actually increases your need for certain nutrients. The biochemical processes that convert glucose into energy, ATP, again, like this is such a like high school biochem refresher, right? <laughs> if you remember that word ATP, that's energy, that's, that's the currency, like we use dollars and cents, the body uses ATP to conduct business. So we, um, oh yeah, when, when you metabolize glucose, you need, it, those processes, the reason we need vitamins and minerals, it's not just for the physical structure of the body, like the calcium and the bones and the teeth, that's one thing. But these, these nutrients serve as cofactors in all the processes that happen. Like the processes can't happen without them. And the burning of glucose specifically requires a ton of magnesium, you need chromium, you need a ton of B vitamins. So guess what? If you're eating two or 300 grams of carbs a day, mm. you, you would have to take a, a 50 million multivitamins maybe to get the, the amount of nutrients that you need to properly run all those processes. Now that we don't have chronically high blood sugar anymore and we don't have chronically high insulin anymore, we actually need less. So even if we're not actually getting any more of this from our awesome keto diet, even if we're just getting the same amount we were getting before with the standard American diet, because our need is less, the amount that we're getting now might be enough. So it's really interesting. That's something that's not talked about enough in the health world, that what you eat actually sort of determines or influences what you need. You need fewer of those nutrients when you're on a ketogenic diet. How am I doing on time? I don't know what time it is. Okay, good. So here's, here's something kind of difficult, but we have to talk about it. We can't, we can't talk about mental health and emotional health without admitting that keto can't fix everything. I wish it could. Wouldn't that be great? If you could just do a ketogenic diet and every single problem you ever had would be fixed. Most of them get fixed, a lot of them get fixed, but not everything. <laughs> and the thing is, if you are dealing with something like anxiety or panic attacks or depression or schizophrenia or bipolar or obesity or type 2 diabetes or any diet related issue, there is a chance that that is a product of a very traumatic experience that you went through in your life. 
It could have been something when you were a child. It could have been something in your adult life. It could have been neglect, abuse, physical assault, sexual assault, what have you. Um, these things leave a mark. And the unfortunate truth is that keto can't undo that. If you've been through something really traumatic, this isn't like the game of operation where I was a kid that you just <laughs> lift the bone out and you could just take it out and put it to the side. Keto can't excise a trauma from your life. Um, I, I, I get a lot of clients who are, are eating fabulously. They eat better than I do. And I'm looking at the paperwork like, you don't need a nutritionist, you need a therapist. You need a babysitter. Like I get all these um, working moms and dads, and dad, mostly the moms though, who are so overextended and overstretched and, and they're working out six days a week and they're doing a million things. And I sort of have to very diplomatically, very politely with the right language say, your diet is great. This isn't a dietary problem. I, I literally have nothing to tell you to improve your diet. You need a babysitter and a night off twice a month is what you need. You know, keto doesn't fix that. If you're in an unhappy, loveless marriage, keto, like all the grass-fed butter, all the organic coconut mm. oil in the world, can't give you a divorce. <laughs> I mean, ah, I wish it could. That would be like a lot cheaper than paying attorneys, right? Um, if you're in a job that you hate, I've been there only too many times in the past. Or Sunday night rolled around, and I'm thinking about Monday morning, like I can't, I can't take one more week of this. I, I can't believe I have to go there in the morning. How many sick days do I have left? And I feel like sick. <laughs> If, you're, if it's Saturday night, it's not even Sunday, and you're already thinking about how bad Monday is going to be, keto can't fix that. Keto can't write your resume. Keto can't get you a new job. Um, again, I wish it could. But the good news is, here's, let's, let's talk about what keto can do. Keto can't fix any of that. Keto can't take it away and make it all better. What keto can do, because of all the things we talked about, because of evening out your blood sugar, because of giving you a little more GABA, because of feeding your brain with ketones, because of giving you all the micronutrients, all the vitamins and minerals, to make your brain the healthiest, most robust, most stable it can be, what keto can do is make you more resilient. Keto can help you cope better. It can give you the emotional fortitude that you might need to seek additional help if you need it. If you do need a therapist, if you do need a psychiatrist, maybe you've been putting it off, maybe you're so, whatever you want to call it, so debilitated that you haven't been able to take that step of getting yourself more help. Keto might, and I say might, might be able to give you that extra oomph, give you just enough emotional and mental stability to tackle some of the stuff that you need to tackle elsewhere, things, things that the diet can't do. Um, so, if you, uh, I would say give it a try. What do you have to lose? Mm -hmm. The only things you have to lose are the foods that you maybe like that are really carby. You have your morning blueberry muffin to lose. You have your sandwich and chips to lose at lunch. But look what you get in return. And what you might gain, you have everything to gain, what you might gain is emotional stability that you haven't had for your entire life or for many years. It could give you sharp thinking, mental clarity. So I honestly think there's literally no reason not to try it. Because here's the thing, I've never, ever, ever heard of keto making anything worse, but bear with me one second. Keto, in, in the sense of mental and emotional health, will either make you feel a little bit better make you feel awesome, or it's gonna keep you the same. I can't imagine a scenario where you would feel worse. The only time I've ever heard of people feeling worse on keto, whether it was emotionally or physically, is when it's just not implemented properly. They probably need more salt, maybe they're doing whatever. They're doing something that's not making it work right. So it's not the fault of the diet, it's that it's not being done properly. So I think I don't see any reason not to do it, especially, what, what is the alternative, you know? Um, let me show on the right slide. The alternative is drugs, right? And, and cognitive therapy and talk therapy, I'm not gonna dismiss the importance of those. Um, but you know, all the talk therapy in the world isn't gonna correct a B6 deficiency. All the talk therapy in the world isn't gonna give you your brain more DHA. But I just, some, some of the medications available for these types of issues are life-saving, right? I don't, I don't debate that. I'm not anti-medication in the right situation. 
Um, but a lot of these psychiatric, psychotropic medications come with really awful side effects. You know, to the, so, so in some people, though, they don't work, period. And in the people where they do work, there's a lot of very horrible side effects to the point where some people would rather live with their depression, rather live with their anxiety than, than have whatever the side effects were. It could be weight gain, it could be... Don't ask me who, who invents these drugs. Some antidepressants come with increased risk for suicide. Mm -hmm. What? what? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna touch that with a 10-foot pole, but I'd rather be depressed than suicidal. And um, some of them, I think, if I'm not mistaken, so don't so, some of them actually increase blood sugar and higher risk for diabetes? Yeah, higher risk for diabetes. Like, you might rather have anxiety than have diabetes. So you have nothing to lose by doing keto. And the beautiful thing about keto is you can do it in conjunction with medication. You can do it with the medication, obviously under the care of a physician, under medical supervision, but you might start the diet and work with your doctor to be able to <coughs> titrate your meds down and monitor how things are going. Um, there's, just, there's just no reason not to do it. Um, you guys know, have you ever heard of Rob Wolf? He's really well known in the paleo world. Rob Wolf calls this his greasy used car salesman pitch. <laughs> Give it a try, take her for a test drive. Give it a try. Try it for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. If you don't feel better, if your condition isn't improving, guess what? Go back to eating what you were eating before, no big deal. You don't have to do keto if you don't want to, but yeah, give it a try. If you're dealing with one of these really, really difficult issues, especially if you're not getting any better with medication, why not try keto? So I kind of think that's all I have for now. I'm, I'm happy to take questions, but I don't know what you guys want to do, but... Oh, 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 we have one more slide. We have a question from online. Oh, awesome, okay. Christy asks, serotonin from carbs is missing. Any concerns? <clears throat> well, okay, yeah, the question is serotonin from carbs is missing. Is there any concern about that? Yes and no. Um, I'm going to admit I'm not the super expert in that particular mechanism. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter that's sort of like one of our feel-good neurotransmitters. They they, they tend to think that a lot of depression is associated with decreased serotonin, except there's a lot of controversy about that theory right now. It's sort of being dismantled. But for many years, it was believed that most people, especially with seasonal affective disorder, have low serotonin. Now serotonin, you know, we hear that we need carbs to get serotonin into the brain. Serotonin comes from tryptophan, I believe, is that right? It's from an amino acid. We don't get it from glucose, we get it from protein. <clears throat> We get from amino acids, we also need vitamin B6 to make serotonin, the biochemical steps that create serotonin from tryptophan. And I, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, the, the concern over low carbon and serotonin is that it's very hard for the brain to, or, or it's either with serotonin or tryptophan, I think tryptophan, it's very hard for tryptophan to get into the brain. And it seems to be that when carbs, again, I don't, I'm not an expert on the mechanism, when there's a lot of carbs in the body, the amino, other amino acids will be taken up by muscles and elsewhere, allowing tryptophan to get into the brain more easily. Is, is that why we all feel better when we eat carbs? I don't know. Um, all, what I do know is that there's like many, many, many thousands, if not millions at this point, of people all around the world doing keto who feel great. I don't, they don't seem to be lacking in serotonin, they don't seem to be lacking in tryptophan. So is there a concern over that? For me, no, no. But that doesn't negate that mechanism, but I just, looking at, and this isn't a clinical trial, but just looking objectively at the evidence in human beings who are alive doing keto, most of them aren't depressed. Most of them don't seem to have any signs and symptoms of serotonin deficiency, so I, I hope that answers. something that was a free class that they offered at the library, which was a tapping class.
And that isn't the dancing. That is an emotional, uh, a method to emotionally get things taken care of. Right, it's using your meridian. Very enlightening. It's something I probably would never have done if I hadn't really thought how important it is for me to look at me now. No, good for you. She, for, for anyone who didn't hear, she was talking about how good keto has been for focus <clears throat> and how it can help you sort of do things that you wouldn't have tried before, especially things that are more cerebral or where you have to focus. I'm not a parent. It's easy for me to speculate as to what goes on in little kids, but ADD, ADHD, is that a disease or is that sugar? <laughs> is that like your kid needs to stop eating sugar? I mean, I, I don't mean to offend anyone, really. I'm not a parent. I, I, I have a niece and a nephew, and I, I don't know how my sister does it. Um, I think, you know, maybe kids just need to get up and run around more. Like, there's a reason they have so much energy, but they probably need to eat a lot less sugar, too. And there's, like, kids that do keto, kids that do low carb, and guess what? So many of those behavior problems get massively better very quickly. Maybe not always. It might not be a slam dunk for 100% of kids, but again, just like Give it a try, give it a try. Your kid might complain, they might cry their head off for two weeks when they can't have their goldfish crackers and then guess what, they get over it. So she asked if, it's, if keto might be good for PTSD. Thank you for asking, that's a veteran, I thank you for asking that. Um, I don't see why not. I've heard some anecdotes. I don't know if there's a lot of published research on that yet. I know the research is being done. I, but I've heard some remarkable stories, and for, for, for so many of these same reasons. But again, keto can't undo the trauma you've been through, whether it was a war or something else, but it could make you better able to cope. I, I, again, I think it's always worth trying. Like I get these questions, Dr. Westman probably gets these questions all the time. Is keto good for insert X condition? And the answer is, try, try it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but if it does, oh my goodness. If it, like, if it doesn't work, the beautiful thing about keto, keto's not bariatric surgery. You can't undo bariatric surgery. If you don't like keto or it's not working, eat a piece of bread, get off the keto diet. It's not a permanent thing. I mean, it should be if you want it to be. If it's not working, nobody's, nobody's making you do it. So it's, it's, all, it's worth trying for just about anything, in my opinion, with the caveat. If, if Dr. Westman wasn't here, we could have so much more fun. With the caveat. <laughs> just about anything, but if you're on certain medications, you have to be monitored by a physician. Don't do it by yourself. You know that commercial, don't try this at home. Like, do it, do it in an intelligent, smart, safe way, but I always think it's worth trying for pretty much anything. Oh, uh-huh. In regards to your book, Right, yeah, good question. So all of it's answered in my book, but I'll give you the short version. Um, he was asking about, do, oh yeah, he was asking about whether we see improvement in people with Alzheimer's who do the ketogenic diet, and then also asking about the exogenous ketones. So if you don't know what the exogenous ketones are, they are, um, there's a couple of different forms they take, mostly it's a powder that you can put into a drink, and it's beta-hydroxybutyrate. It's a ketone that you can basically take as a supplement. Before I answer the question, just so we're all clear, exogenous ketones are not a substitute for the ketogenic diet. Can I stamp the other foot too? <laughs> not a substitute for the diet. Um, yes, we have some clinical trial research published and anecdotal data from families of people with Alzheimer's that the ketogenic diet helps. Does it reverse Alzheimer's completely? No, at least not yet. Um, does it improve cognitive function and behavior? Yeah, in, in most people. I can't say it would work in everybody. Um, it might depend on how far gone they are and, and on other things. The exogenous ketones also have really helped some people. The exogenous ketones as well as things like MCT and coconut oil, which are more readily converted into ketones than other sources of fat. Again, doesn't, doesn't restore cognitive function entirely. I mean, if, if it did, we would have already heard about that long ago. It helps a little bit. It helps, which I still think is worth doing, especially if you have someone that's really severely 
you know, in, impaired or, um, you know, to not, not just to improve their life, to improve the caregivers' lives and the loved ones' lives, make that person a, just a little sharper. So again, I always think it's worth trying, especially for Alzheimer's, there are zero drugs that work for Alzheimer's. Big fat goose egg on that one. There's drugs on the market. It's not, there's not, it's not that there's no drugs available, they just don't do anything to actually help this disease get any better. So yeah, I think, I think that keto is the single most promising thing we have going for Alzheimer's right now. Unfortunately, the research is not quite as solid or it's not the slam dunk it is for like the diabetes and PCOS and the fatty liver and all that, but I still think there's no reason not to do it. have any information on prevention, like long-term prevention of Alzheimer's with a ketogenic or low-carb diet. I can't say we have that because nobody's looking for it. I mean, I can't imagine how many, not millions with an M, but billions with a B of dollars it would cost to fund a trial like that. Okay, Let's, what about like an observational? Study? Well, no, there's not, as, as far as I know, there's not even any observational. What we have is common sense though. And I honestly think that we really forget about good old-fashioned common sense in the scientific world. What we know is that Alzheimer's is a really friggin' brand new disease. It's not totally brand new. There were documented cases of it way back in the day, just like diabetes, just like there were some obese people back in the day. Nothing like there is now. Nothing like there is now with type two diabetes, PCOS, fatty liver, Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease. All of these things existed hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. Nowhere near at the level now. So, Clearly those people back then were doing something right or not doing things wrong in order to stave off Alzheimer's. Can we say for sure what those protective things were? No. I offer some speculation in my, I mean, I think we can kind of all speculate. As to, they don't call it type three diabetes for nothing. Um, you know, I don't know for sure that we can prevent Alzheimer's. I think we can. I don't know if there's ever gonna be a way to prove that we absolutely can. I have not looked. It wouldn't surprise me, though. Okay. I haven't looked yet. There was a bunch of hands. Uh -huh. yeah. um, some recent research that just came out a few months ago shows that there are large amounts of particulate matter in the brains of people with dementia and Alzheimer's. That particular matter comes from air pollution. So maybe one of the reasons why we have this problem now in larger numbers than we had before very severe air pollution all over the world now. Even the very highest levels of the ionosphere of the planet are now showing very large amounts of particulate matter. So um, that's one thing I wanted to say. The second thing I wanted to say was I did research online and I found that um, a lot of people who have dementia or beginning symptoms are taking MCT oil that is medium chain triglycerides. So uh, of course it's recommended for keto also. I had a stroke in 2013 with very severe memory problems afterwards. And I've been taking the MCT oil now for two months and had incredible improvement. Within a week, I could tell the difference. Wow. wow. doing everything. 
so the first thing she said is that she's doing really well with MCT oil. She had a stroke, what, three years ago, five years ago? 2013. 2013. But you've been on the MCT oil for two months, you said? Two months. Okay. So MCT oil is helping with her memory, helping with her cognition, which doesn't surprise me. And um, the other thing, and, and she mentioned air pollution as a possible factor in Alzheimer's. I'm not ready to rule anything out. So could that be a factor? Yeah. Um, could yeah. Anything could, you know, we don't know. We don't know what causes Alzheimer's. I, I, I offer a lot of information about one particular theory, which is the metabolic theory, the type three diabetes theory, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other things. Um, it they does mean, mean though that since we have seen this in the brains of people with dementia and Alzheimer's, that if we have air purifiers in our home, it's very important to keep the air clean, that you breathe as much as you can, and, um, other, and also to know that mold and mildew are contributing causes for dementia and Alzheimer's, particularly black mold, yeah. which we all know is very dangerous. So I just want to throw that in there. This means that you can do something about it if you have air purifiers, and that it's important for you to have them. Thank you. So in terms of a fat loss doll, that's more of Dr. Westman's area of expertise, but the things that, that we tend to look for first when somebody's stalled and to be clear, you are in the demographic that does struggle the most with fat loss. 71. Older women, postmenopausal women. Yeah. Men, we love you, but we kind of hate you at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> because men could stop looking at beer and lose 20 pounds. You just, I mean, and a woman, like, I, I can smell a cupcake and forget it. So that, that's like, there's a very severe men you know, men, women difference. Um, and it's really unfair, but that's kind of the way it is. And um, I, I do think the hormones have something to do with it being postmenopausal. That's a question for Jackie Everstein um, next time she comes back. So the things we tend to look for when people are stalled, are, are you on any medications that might be interfering with that loss? Okay, so that's... Didn't you say you were a couch potato? I am a couch potato. Yeah, but haven't you seen Dr. Westman's video with the lady in the wheelchair who lost weight on keto? She's not exercising. So exercise can help, but it shouldn't be, if your diet is right, exercise shouldn't be required. I'm not telling you not to exercise, but exercise isn't the most effective thing to get body fat off. Um, we tend to look for just overdoing the fat. So keto is not a license to eat unlimited fat. I've made that mistake myself in the past. You can even be in ketosis and gain body fat if you're overdoing the fat. When you're, so just because your carbs are really, really low, and you're actually in ketosis, whether you measure blood, breath, or urine, you're sure you're in ketosis. All that means is you're burning fat. You don't know whether you're burning the avocado and the MCT oil and the butter and the cream and the olive oil, or are you burning the bagel you ate 20 years ago, yeah. you know? So that's, that's the first thing we look for. We always look for like extra carbs, but. When I found out that there was a percentage I was supposed to meet every day on Carb Manager. No. That's no. when I stopped losing weight. Yeah, no, no. No percentages. I have. To, I, I don't mean to keep plugging my YouTube channel, but I keep plugging my YouTube channel. Um, there's. I have a video called "There's No Such Thing as Keto Macros." There is no such thing as keto macros. What puts you into ketosis and what prompts fat burning is the absence of carbs, not the presence of a ton of fat. And here's the examples, right? If you fast, let's say you fast for three days, 72 hours, you've eaten nothing. Your fat macro is zero. Your fat percentage is zero. Do you think you won't be in ketosis after a three-day fast? Of course you will, but your fat macro is zero. I didn't eat enough percentage fat, because there's no such thing. You could eat a diet that's 100% sugar and be in ketosis and lose weight, and here's how. Let's say you eat two sugar cubes a day and nothing else. That's all you eat. You wake up and you eat one sugar cube, 10 hours later you eat another sugar cube. Your carb macro is 100%. Your diet is 100% sugar. Do you think you won't be in ketosis if that's all you eat? So these percentages are nonsense. Like, and I, I, I hope, I'm not insulting you. Like, this is one of my favorite topics because so many of my clients will send to me like, well, I'm eating 80% fat, why aren't I losing weight? Or like, these, these apps are, I kind of wish they didn't exist. When I was new to this, all there was was the Atkins book. There was Atkins and there was Protein Powder and there was Power and there was the Schwarzbein Principle. Three books and one website, one forum, that's it. We're talking 2000, about 2000-ish. 2000 
And it was so much easier because I didn't think I was supposed to eat a certain percentage. Of, if that's what you're doing, yeah. that's done. Just keep the carbs really low. You, you, enjoy the fat. I, I, I have to be so careful when I talk I because I don't want to... Yeah, I don't want to make you afraid of fat, but you don't have to go out of your way to add extra fat in order to make some ratio. Yeah, if cool. anything, you should be eating more protein, especially as an older lady. You want more protein, and you can enjoy fat. Don't be scared of fat, but you don't have to load everything up with extra. Okay, thank you. Yes, but if the MCT oil is helping the brain, yes. that is one thing that I would not cut. Yeah. yeah. Do you want Yeah, because I had a cup of hepatitis before and I had taken the flagell many times in India for dysentery. So that's part of your liver. So I just have to kind of watch the other Well, you seem really sharp to me. I would have never known you had a stroke, so. I've just been doing a lot of research online. A lot. What's some of the best salts you use? Oh, so, huh, good question. This is a very controversial topic, and everyone online is going to crucify me right now. What you need on a ketogenic diet is sodium chloride. You need NaCl. And you can get that from any salt. You can get it from Gordon's white refined garbage salt, if that's what you want. I don't mean garbage. I'm just saying that's the salt that everybody's so opposed to. Oh, it's just white refined table. It's just salt. If you want to spring for a little more expensive salt, I love Redmond sea salt, I love the Celtic gray salt, but I get, honestly, I use them because I think they taste better. I don't use them because I'm a, like if I'm at a restaurant, whatever's in the salt shaker is what I'm using. I'm not to the point, like there are some nutritionists that will carry their own little pouch of salt. Okay, you know, God bless you, to eat your own. Um, but the, some people, there, there's two main concerns over the salts. The, the sort of pure white table salt, there's some concern that there's like additives in it or there's residue of whatever chemicals they use to refine it. It's just NAC and it's bleached and whatever, so there's some concern. I'm just not that concerned. If you're using that much salt, that's, that's probably a bigger problem than what's contaminating the salt, is the fact that you're using enough salt to be worried about that. The second issue is that the unrefined salts, the Celtic gray salt, the Redmond salt, slightly higher in minerals because it's not just sodium chloride. If you look at the Redmond salt, it's even got like little red and brown flecks in it because it has tiny, tiny trace amounts of iron and manganese and all that stuff. However, speaking as a nutritionist, but this is only my opinion, if you're relying on Redmond salt to be your primary source of minerals in your diet, you're doing it wrong. So I'm not, I'm not the concern. If you want, like truly, I use those fancy salts, but I use them because they taste better. I don't use them because I have any health concern about it. How do, you, how do you make up for the iodine, though, that you're losing? In, in the regular table salt? Yeah, I mean, we all grew up using Morton's, and Morton's has iodine. Yeah, added. that's why you should use the iodine <laughs> salt, because it's got the iodine, and everyone's so damn afraid of it. The, um, no, the regular table salt, the Morton's usually does have the iodine. The unrefined fancy schmancy salt don't. So if you're using the fancy, I can't do that. So you, you might, you might, you might want to. You make up for your iodine. I you think you know, read the labels or contact the company because some of them do have the iodine in it, not because it's added like with the Mortons, but because it contains it naturally. You know, if it's um, from like a, a dehydrated sea salt instead of like some salt mine or something, there might be iodine in it naturally. It's not iodized artificially like the Mortons is. Entire books have been written. I can't comment because it's so controversial. That is an extremely controversial topic. But if you don't get iodine, then you're going to get goiters and your thyroid's not going to work. Almost nobody in the United States has goiter right now. I'm not saying that doesn't mean we have enough iodine, but. Because there's iodine in the salt. Okay. But if we stop eating yeah. that salt, then we'll stop eating it. Then don't stop eating That's it. That's when they started adding it. So <coughs> well, they also used to iodize. In, in, not that anyone here is eating bread or dough or baked goods, but they used to use potassium. What am I thinking of? The um, bromate. The bromate. What, what potassium? But so now they use potassium bromide as a dough conditioner. They used to use potassium iodide. We used to get iodine and iodide from other sources that we no longer get it from. I still am just not that concerned about that. 
if, if you are concerned, eat some seaweed. Get, get the kelp granules that they sell. At the, you can almost use it as salt. It's delicious on eggs, delicious in soups, omelets. I'm not that concerned. But it's a very controversial issue. I'm sure people watch like, what about paresis? What about hypothyroid? What about this? It's extremely controversial. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Oh, no, I just, I'm just saying like why I'm not answering, because whatever I say is, is going to be incorrect. Thank you. Just to uh, reiterate a few themes, one is the nutrition, the nutritional requirements change based on what you eat. In fact, the whole guideline for what humans should eat has to be different for those who are eating a keto diet. And so my response was going to be, the wolf doesn't take iodine supplements, and the wolf doesn't get avoided. So. Yeah, okay, that's supposed to be a little bit funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. the, the idea that you have to add something back was a phenomenon of eating in, in the south, basically in the goiter belt, an area where humans were eating lots of carbohydrates and not getting enough iodine. You replace the iodine, you can fix it, or you can just eat wonderfully delicious, nutritious foods, like wolves don't get now. Hope someone will Google this and see if wolves do get goiters. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much, Amy. And uh, mental health issues, you know, clinically, just about everyone um, uh, has an improvement in mood, but not everyone uh, when they change from not eating carbohydrates, not eating carbohydrates, to, from eating carbohydrates to not eating carbohydrates. But I have to say, in my clinic, it's not 100% that everyone gets better. So. Your mileage may vary. Um, I wanted to just um, uh, <coughs> give a recap for the last month that I had uh, in February. If I could just share a, a fraction of the enthusiasm. I mean, it'd be kind of like tonight. How many of you are doing a keto diet? Raise your hand. Yeah, so look around. You're not alone. Now imagine you're in a room with 600 people. Mm all raising their hands wow. doing a keto diet. Wow. That was my experience in three different meetings over the last month. That sum total was 600 people. But uh, so in Nashville, there were 320 people all in the same room on a Saturday, often traveling miles and miles, you know, from Illinois down to Tennessee. I think Dr. Ken Berry was part of the big draw there. If you don't know his videos, he says it like it is, and I find myself um, thinking the things he says, but not daring to say the things he says. Um, but um, on that note, if you're interested in a pretty nice video about what's in the news this week, the keto crotch, uh, check, 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 in and check out Ken Berry's video. He does a very nice job of saying how low people have stooped to fabricate something that doesn't exist, because keto is doing so well, they're grasping at straws to come up with something that people would not even try. So anyway, it, what a big distraction that is. Hopefully it'll have the media legs of about a, a week, and it'll be gone. But Ken did a nice job, Dr. Barry, Dr. Ken Barry did a nice job on a video on YouTube, if you want to look into that non-existent condition. Um, and so this last month, you know, if you can imagine, um, my, I learned not to always talk and, and talk a lot when people were telling me their stories of, you know, hello Dr. Westman, I've lost 85 pounds, I'm off my insulin and I feel great. Hello Dr. Westman, I've lost 100 pounds and I'm off of it. You know, imagine if a surgeon was in a room and everyone, 350 people that he had operated on or she came up and said thank you. I mean, it's overwhelming. It, the, the, the change that people have had um, it, and getting together, as Ken, Dr. Perry said, nobody gets together on Saturdays coming miles and miles and paying 60 bucks for Weight Watchers. <laughs> you know? Uh, it, it, the um, enthusiasm, so Nashville, we were in Nashville, we were in Atlanta, <coughs> outside of Atlanta, and then outside of Tampa. And I just want to thank everyone who, who came out. To these ADAPT events. The ADAPT Your Life company 
with Glenn and Yale Finkel is another company I'm involved in, like the Heal Clinics, but it's a product and a group um, uh, uh, facilitating sort of company to get people together. And many of these programs that we had in February will actually start a local support group in that area, which is really cool. Um, and we started each event with having people raise their hands and looking around to make sure that they knew they weren't all alone doing this. Um, anyway, so that was my month of February and why my voice is now starting to come back. Um, but um, it was a great experience. We were planning on doing some more adapt events in July in the upper Midwest and then, then in October in the south again when it's cooler again. So um, uh, watch out for these adapt events, adapt your life, adapterlife.com. There are some really nice keto mini bars if you want to try those out, but we prefer real food over any kind of convenience products as a general principle. I just wanted to kind of conclude with the Heal Clinic idea of knowing when you need a doctor and when you don't. We're, we're developing a pretty much a, a boundary where, yes, this is healthy eating for just about anyone, but when you're starting to get into a clinical population, like, like Amy was saying, when you're starting to deal with people who are on insulin for diabetes, you're on blood pressure medicines, and you don't understand that those medicines have to be monitored and adjusted down. Insulin needs to be adjusted on the first day you change the diet, it has to be adjusted down. That's where we draw the line at the heel clinics to say, well, no, you need to be followed by someone who understands how to take you off those medicines safely. So we do a lot of discussion about this being healthy eating in general. The babies are born in ketosis. How can this be terrible? The, what we are learning is that we want the safe management and de-prescribing of drugs to be as safe as possible. So that is kind of, I wanted to just, because uh, I know a lot of folks have talked about the clinical scenario tonight and, and the non-clinical. If you're on medications, you don't know how to manage those, talk to someone who can help you manage those medicines. Okay. Were there any questions tonight um, uh, or experiences? Um, we're, often we want new folks to come on up and say, why did you come out? And, and, uh, or, or old, I mean, people who've been here before. Uh, yes? And cholesterol at 280. So what about that pesky cholesterol? Don't even worry about it. <laughs> Next question. Oh, you're not satisfied with that. <laughs> you know, it's yes. as if, um, have you ever measured, uh, um, so this is called one of the principles of keto medicine, which is a new branch of medicine, because we just made it up. <laughs> I, I gave the first lecture on keto medicine last month, and it's a new field where we don't worry about the cholesterol levels. We worry about the ketone level and the blood glucose level. Or if there's an LDL or total cholesterol worry, we look at the HDL and triglycerides, not just the old way of looking at things. So I know there's a, I, I, I mean, I'm going to be kept in business for a long time, helping, reassuring people that that cholesterol is fine. Don't worry, it's fine. And if you're above a certain age, there's no evidence that a statin will do any good for you. But that even gets me into the, Ugh. You're an anti-statinator, I'm not, you're an anti-vaxxer, you're, I mean, oh no. So I played the politics a little bit to be able to know the strength with which your doctor holds on to that prescription. And then that's how I gauge whether to just rip it out of your hand. But, um, so don't worry about the cholesterol, I'm happy to discuss them uh, with you in a clinical setting too. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think um, Adapt Your Life is planning a Raleigh, Durham, Roxborough area event in October again. Last year, the Rox Adapt uh, North Carolina was in Roxborough. It may not be at the same place. I'm not sure that's under um, consideration at the moment. But yes, there probably will be another Adapt event in the fall in this area as well. I had a cardiologist say that keto is part of a blood vessel. And I wonder what your thoughts were on that. So your cardiologist told you that keto is hard on the blood vessels. Yeah. 
He's all for it. I mean, he liked, you know, the results and everything, and he made that comment. I have no idea what that means. I did some research, and the only thing I saw was talking about the elasticity. I don't so, know if that was what he meant. Yeah, there's a, uh, a paradigm of research where you look at the blood vessel reactivity. And um, the, there were several studies done. Interestingly, the one uh, study done by Jeff Volek, who's kind of a low-carb guy, but um, he at least has an open mind and doesn't see what he wants to see in these kinds of studies, found that the brachial reactivity was fine in those on a keto diet. We, we went and, but there was another study that was contrary to that. I mean, this goes back 10 years. And, and I don't even know that the cardiology field really relies on those tests anymore much. One of the things I did see was it sounded kind of like the cholesterol concern. It may be a spike, but then it rectifies itself as time goes on. But I was just curious what your thoughts were. Yeah, uh, you know, the big study for, to reassure the cardiology field which we want to help with is to take people, randomize them, those with heart disease, and they might even have diabetes at the same time, and you put them on a keto diet versus regular care, and you follow them over time and see what happens. Without uh, That will tell you whether the cholesterol matters, whether the brachial reactivity matters, whether the inflammation score matters, whether the tea leaves you read in the tea <laughs> and coffee matter, <coughs> because often I think that's what we're doing. We're, we're, the cholesterol is just a measurement in the blood. Um, you can actually get the arterial <coughs> monitoring directly. In our area, there's a company called Life Lifeline. Lifeline. Lifeline Screening. They'll come by in the dead of night in church as usual. <laughs> and, and, uh, and they'll come around and measure your arteries. And that's, I would recommend that. Especially so if someone's doing this lifestyle, they're worried about these kinds of issues, get these scans done and follow the arteries directly over time, not the cholesterol level in the blood. That's not sufficient. Yeah. So I went for my annual checkup this last month, and all the numbers were great. I was always pre I was pre-diabetes, now I'm below that, and all the other numbers are great. Uh, HDL, or the high cholesterol, went up 15. However, the low went up 15 points as well, which made that number at the top higher. But the triglycerides, which were 242, went down, <coughs> to, went down to 120. So am I good? <laughs> <laughs> so um, the high number went up and the low number, but the middle went down. It's uh, yes. just joke. So <laughs> what you typically <laughs> see... They both went up, but so the, the, um, the ratio was actually higher. was better. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, you know, um, so I, I'm I kind of. So I was concerned about that low going up. Yeah. The low cholesterol going up. Yeah, so um, I'm not quite sure what you're talking about in terms of low cholesterol. You mean LDL? The LDL. Yeah, right. Went so, up about 15, but so did the HDL. And right. the triglycerides came down to 120. Right. So, so, is it my good? So this is an interesting <laughs> phenomenon. Depending on who you talk to, you're going to get a different opinion. My doctor so, didn't seem to be upset about it. She was... Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so your doctor wasn't upset. So, <coughs> even when you look at published studies, published studies and um, uh, the, ex the experts, they don't agree on whether you look at LDL <coughs> as a ratio with HDL. Or is it total with HDL? Or is it just one number alone without the ratio? And if HDL is so high, you don't, well, then you don't worry about it at all. I mean, so um, there's a new guideline online that you can actually log in your own results to. Yeah, it's okay. called the um, cbdriskcalculator.com. CB, you know, you're not writing it down. So CBD. CVDRiskCalculator.com, and, um, and interestingly, LDL is not even in that calculator anymore. That the one you were worried about isn't even in that calculator. So there's a, what you're seeing is a shift from the the guidelines and the researchers, and there's a big lag from the clinical people 
depending on where they practice, depending on whether they're up to date, whether they're a cardiologist or they're, they're a general doctor, there's going to be a, uh, a, a difference of opinion wherever you go, which in my mind, um, I'm just not even worried about um, not when you're on a keto diet. So the phenomenon of bad cholesterol is a phenomenon of eating carbohydrates. That's another way to say it. When you're not eating those carbohydrates, the cholesterol phenomenon doesn't matter because you don't have the inflammation. Yeah. I think we need to wrap up. With yeah. The website, one more time. The website, one more time. So cvdriskcalculator.com. Like cardiovascular disease. And Charlie B is in Victor. D is in Delta. Delta. Is there? Yeah. Yeah, so what's typically, another question about the cholesterol, the type of LDL cholesterol, the large or the small, and, and the cholesterol story has been refined into that, the large LDL, fluffy, doesn't get into trouble, it's the small LDL that gets, that gets a problem. The problem with that is that even uh, in, uh, someone's doing a keto diet well and correctly and for a long period of time, the, it doesn't always go away. It doesn't always look perfect and yet they may not have the disease started. So there's a, a, a cholesterol plus inflammation interaction that has to be occurring for the disease to be created. So you cut the carbs down, the inflammation goes way down, the cholesterol itself isn't gonna get into trouble. And that's in a book called Cholesterol Clarity, which I, you know, Jimmy Moore asked me to write it, and it's this old phenomenon. I remember asking a university professor, uh, he was asking me, how do you know, and Dr. Westman, how do you know something? And I'm this young doctor wanting to be a university doctor. And I said, well, Dr. Feinstein, it's by teaching it. He said, no, no, Alvin Feinstein at Yale, um, some may remember him. He said, you know it by writing. So you really don't know something until you bring it in, you, and then you write it. So Cholesterol Clarity is a book that Jimmy Moore and I put together and wrote, and it's not about the cholesterol, it's about inflammation. Mm -hmm. And the researchers that are trying to get this message out can't get it out because of the, oh, that thing called the money flowing in a certain way. <laughs> yeah. so, so check out Cholesterol Clarity. It's, it's not, I mean, it's a tough read because it's very scientific. Yeah. It's basically podcast interviews that Jimmy did with these researchers, Jimmy Moore, and he just wrote them in there and had them revised. And it, it took me putting that book together to make that conversion. And, but, yeah. I just, I want to put in a plug. If, if any of you are concerned about the cholesterol. Oh. Please come on. I can shout. Then we really do have to. Okay, so I just wanted to put in a plug for if you are concerned about the cholesterol issue, definitely Cholesterol Clarity is a dynamite book. There's um, a, a, a PhD researcher named David Diamond, Diamond like the ring on your finger, um, and he has some really, really great videos on YouTube about, you've seen them, yeah, oh, yeah. fabulous. He's, um, how do I describe him? I, I won't describe him, I will leave it to your discretion. David Diamond, he's given some really outstanding lectures on whether high cholesterol is of any concern, and especially, most especially, regarding statin drugs, who should take them, if anyone, where, why, how, and it's just really great stuff. David Diamond, look at his videos. So thanks for Amy coming out tonight. Yeah. We'll, be, we'll be back here uh, first Tuesday of the month, April 2nd, and we'll be back here, no guest speaker at the moment, no, not announced yet, but um, what we'll do, with, if there is no guest speaker, is have you come on up, give your stories or, or troubleshoot things for you, kind of like tonight, we did a little bit. Uh, but again, Amy, thanks for coming. Tonight's talk about mental health and keto, and hope you have a wonderful evening.